to ID the Future. I'm Robert Crowther with the Center for Science and Culture. Today I am in Seattle, Washington in the Discovery Institute Conference Room. I am joined by uh, Senior Fellow and Biologist Michael Denton. Hello, Michael. Good to talk to you, Rob. It's okay to call you a biologist, is that right? That'll be okay. It's close. Um, oh, well, are you a geneticist? Well, basically, I have a medical degree uh -huh. And uh, I did a PhD in developmental biology in King's, but I've been a human geneticist researcher for the last 30 years. So uh -huh. I suppose I'm a human medical geneticist. We'll medical geneticist. Okay, so degree from Bristol University and from King's College. Um, you have a brand new book out, Children of Light. Hold that copy up. Yeah. This is shameless self promotion. promotion that's all right. <laughs> Quite um, <laughs> uh, most of our listeners, though, will probably be familiar with your most famous work, or one of your most famous works from the 1980s, the original Evolution, A Theory in Crisis. Uh, and maybe that it's uh, safe to say that book helped establish you as one of the, I guess, modern-day critics of modern evolutionary theory. And founding fathers of the ID movement, perhaps. Right. Yeah. Yes, even <laughs> that as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because that was one of the first books that really ignited a lot of the research that has gone into propelling uh, both criticisms of Darwin's theory, but also advancing intelligent design. Yes. Yeah. I, um, I admit to it. <laughs> you admit to it. Well, that's good. Most people already know it. So... <laughs> Um, but since people know about those things, maybe they don't know much about you. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions about what you like about science. And so I thought it'd be good to get to know Michael Denton a little bit and where you came from and how you got into science and, and whatever else it is that you've gotten up to. Well, I've always been interested and fascinated in biological things. I mean, from a kid looking down a microscope watching amoebas, paramecia, and you know, the drama in a drop of water, you know. Now, I've always been fascinated in all, all life forms, from my dogs, my cats, uh, right down to these little microbes in a drop of water. And, um, but I've never been very good at filling in forms, particularly <laughs> in maturity tax forms, <laughs> or visa forms, you know, and in fact it was my, I wanted to go to med school, but it was my mother who had to fill in the form and send it off, actually, and um, so, um, yeah, so then I had interviews at Bristol University and started a medical career, uh, uh, in medical training in Bristol, wonderful place, southwest of England, um, uh, weekends in Devon and Cornwall, and uh, beautiful country. Yeah. Nice. So then I went into medicine, and um, uh, and when I was doing medicine, my original, I was brought up as a very uh, strong, uh, uh, in the fundamentals Christian home. When I went to med school, um, I began to wonder about things, as I think you know, most people do. And after med school, I decided to s see if I could recover my... Um, childhood faiths, in, so I went off to Israel, and I, I, wow. I enrolled at the Hebrew University in Israel, and, and spent nearly the best part of a year there, um, and then found that, well, okay, it's, it's nice here, but I'm still interested in science and medicine, you know, and, and, and I enrolled to do um, Near Eastern Archaeology and Jewish Studies at the Hebrew University. But anyway, I, I decided I'll have a go at going back into science. And so that from, from the Hebrew University, I applied to King's College in London, which was in its glory days, just after the DNA helix, right? <laughs> and uh, I, I think the professor I applied to was it's a guy called Henry Einstein. I think was famous because he did some work on the ribosome quite a long time ago. Um, probably thought I was a Jewish student and, you know, because I applied from Israel, uh, and I, so I went to King's then, and uh, I um, had a wonderful time there. Collegiate atmosphere was fantastic, and uh, um, and so I studied in the, 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 the basic area of developmental biology, focused on the differentiation of the red cell from the marrow, the precursors in the marrow, to the little erythrocyte, which 
busily runs around the body carrying oxygen from the body. And do you want me to continue? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's this is right. interesting. I'm, I'm, good, okay. I'm good to know you. Well, basically, what happened was, um, what really made me start thinking about Darwinism uh, was that I was studying a very fascinating phenomenon, that is the formation of the enucleate red cell. All of, the, all of the vertebrates, apart from mammals, have nucleated cells. But we, and all of the mammals, lose the nucleus. The cell, the erythrocyte, has no nucleus. It loses its nucleus. And um, on, on contemplating how you could explain this in terms of Darwinism, I found it was extremely challenging because you know it's very difficult to slowly lose your nucleus. Yeah. <laughs> and so how do you know whether when you push the nucleus out, it's going to be better than it was with the nucleus in the cell, right? So, and in, and in modern development, it takes about twenty minutes for the cell nucleus to be extruded. So this is a sudden saltational event. So how do you account for you know sudden saltational events in terms of gradual Darwinian evolution? How could this have come about? How can a cell lose its nucleus slowly? And the more I thought about the thing, the more curious it struck me. What also struck me was that red cells carry out the most important physiological function on Earth. That's carrying oxygen from the lungs to the tissues in mammals and, and humans. So what is very weird is though that birds, which have a higher demand of oxygen, uh, their tissues are more hungry for oxygen now, I was thinking of a hummingbird, okay? Um, so I thought, well that's funny, why do birds keep the nucleus, you see? I mean, n now, you know, the Darwinian problem here, is this an adaptive move, getting rid of your nucleus? Because birds keep it and they have a higher amount of oxygen than mammals. So not only does this thing occur in 20 minutes, it's, it's a sudden step thing, because Darwinism is based on gradual adaptation, right? And here was something that was sudden, and it didn't seem to be necessarily adaptive, because birds keep it. And you, the stories I, I, I heard there were that, in fact, the beautiful sort of thin plate-like shape of the cell was so that the so that it could exchange oxygen easily, it has a sort of biconcave shape, the oxygen can get in and out you know, of, the, of the cell easily. But when the cell goes through the, loop, through the capillaries, it's all crumpled up. So when yeah. it does its job, it's crumpled. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't have this shape. So what selective value does the shape form? Did the shape, you know, confer? And, um, and then, I, then, I, then I, I knew, well, everybody knows this, that in fact, the size of red cells in mammals varies from about 12 microns across to 7 as it is in humans, right down to 2 and 3 as it is in deer mouse. So there's all these different sizes. For instance, cats and dogs have slightly different sized erythrocytes. And then I thought, this is a minefield. Explaining all this in terms of Darwin is absolutely impossible. Here we have the most important physiological function on Earth, and there's so many features of it which are very difficult to account for in terms of Darwinism that basically I left King's, I left my PhD thinking this can't be accounted for by Darwinism, at least something in the biological world is totally enigmatic. So um, your, your research and your PhD at King's is pretty much what led you to be a Darwin doubter. I, I think yes, I mean I was, when I was, when I was brought up um, up, till I, up till I go to medical school, I was a Darwin doubter by faith, you know, mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, God had created man, you know, a few thousand years ago. We weren't actually exactly young earth creationists, but, you know, man was created in the relative and recent past, roughly as he is, by special creation. So I was no, I was a Darwin doubter then, I mean, you know, I wouldn't have, I would never have given you know, any, any thought of Darwinism at all. I mean, I was a special creationist when I went to med school. At med school, I sort of moved back, moved towards a more conventional Darwinian view of things. Not quite, it's, it's, it's complex. But then when I went to King's to do a PhD, wow. I thought, well, it might not be special creation that made the red cell, but you can't account for it in terms of Darwinism. So, you know, okay. that, that was, that, so I sort of went full circle. And then from then, from that time onwards, I've, um, I've, li I've been a Darwin doubter for the rest of my life without any, you know, without any second thoughts. I've always been a Darwin doubter. And you've, you've done a, a 
lot of research all over the world in various places, yes. um, all related to, or a lot of it related to red blood cells and then retinal. And then the retina. Right. So my, my area of expertise is focused on the simplest of all cells in the human body, the red cell, and on the most complicated of cells, the photoreceptor. <laughs> so I've studied Both the simplest and, and the most complex cells. And, and you're uh, a doubter from beginning to end of both of those from, ends, beginning, right? <laughs> to, from beginning to end entirely um, and not only am I a doubt about Darwinism over the years in fact when I wrote Evolution Theory and Crisis if you read between the lines of that book you can see that I'm defending the, the, the ancient theory of types um, uh, so the Evolution Theory and Crisis I know it's that sort of was one of the foundational sort of documents of the ID movement, I dare admit to this. <laughs> but um, basically, the, if, you, if, you look, if you look at the book, it's in many of the chapters, it, there's the theory of types is there. The idea that, in fact, there's a limited number of basic types in nature, um, which are sort of built into nature itself. In other words, they're not the product of Darwinian evolution to serve functions. They're um, rather like a pattern of leaves, or the shape of the maple leaf. They're, they're, um, they're as it were, they're patterns in nature which don't seem to serve any specific obvious purpose. This is the theory of types, the essentialism of pre-Darwinian biology, which I find very attractive. And, uh, and so in the, in the 15 years from leaving Kings as a Darwinian doubter to when I started writing Evolution Theory and Crisis, I moved um, away from sort of classical Anglo-Saxon functionalist biology, which is Paley's watch. Mm -hmm. uh, John Ray, Paley, Darwin, Wallace, <laughs> to modern ID. That's, that's a functionalist tradition. And I, I have no objection to it, but nonetheless, I was attracted to the structuralist alternative, the idea that in fact there were types in nature, which unlike the parts of a watch, don't serve any specific function, but are, are patterns like the shape of them. And the maple leaf's a beautiful example because a maple tree has the samara, the winged the wing seed. That's obviously a beautifully adaptive form, and Darwin and Slivet they talk about it in every high school, um, how it carries the seed in the wind away, it performs a definite function, and it probably evolved gradually to do that. But the maple leaf they never talk about. The shape of the maple leaf is never talked about, because that simply doesn't fit in with the functionalist notion. It's a beautiful pattern. And, um, like if you take daisies, some, some daisies have 12 petals, some have 15, some have 20, some have 54 different species. Trying to give any adaptive functional explanation in terms of utility of these different patterns has is, is, is never been given. And um, I mean, botany is full of these patterns, you know, all over the place, you know, diff different, different types of flowers and different things like that. So I became attracted to the structuralist view and the first blush of structuralism was in evolution, uh, a theory of crisis. So it wasn't just criticizing chance uh, uh, mutations as, as, as the building blocks of the biological world. It wasn't just criticizing Darwinism. It was also hinting at uh, a deep order in biology, which was simply beyond, by definition, uh, Darwinian things. Most people haven't seen that very clearly from the book, but that is definitely in the book if you look at it. And when I, when I updated the book to Evolution Still a Theory in Crisis, well then it's very obvious that that's, 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 an, that's, an, um, that's a sort of, uh, basically it's a, it's, a, it's a beginning to the end, it's a sort of manifesto of structuralism from the beginning to the end, insisting that the biological world contains a lot of order that is beyond, by definition, functionalist type Darwinian explanations. And, um, and that also, the structures view also, of course, perfectly concordant with the children of the light, uh, the wonder of water, fire maker, the idea that life's, life's order is written into the very fabric of reality itself. And so it's, uh, it's not an add-on, it's in there from the very beginning. So that's, uh, that's in, a, in a sort of a few minutes my biological... There, there it is, your whole journey beginning to 
current. Yeah. Uh, because it's not the end. There will be more coming. But I want to thank you for taking a few minutes to talk with us. Yeah. Uh, the new book is Children of Light. And it is available at Amazon.com, of course. It's in the Privileged Species series of books. Uh, you mentioned the two others, Wonder of Water and Fire Maker. Fire. Um, all great books, and I encourage everybody watching to get them and check them out. And thank you very much, Michael Denton. And Rob, it was a pleasure to talk about these things. And thank you. All right, we'll do it again soon.